Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast presented by Applied Software. You're invited to join our MEP and construction innovation adventure with a mission to propel this great industry forward. My guest today is Tahira Ali. She is a highly skilled technology strategist with more than 16 years of R&D and product design experience. As Nika's executive director of industry innovation, she gathers insights from end users, industry experts, and tech providers to deliver awareness, education, and implementation strategies to specialty contractors. These efforts serve to empower contractors to strategically leverage technical innovations and industry trends to provide process and productivity to increase market share. Welcome to the show, Tahira. Well, thank you, Todd. It's so great to be here. And I love how you framed it up as both an adventure and a mission. So That's we've got <laughs> some great things ahead of us. Absolutely. Yeah, it takes a uh, takes a village to, to move uh, this industry and have all of our voices talking about the innovations and the cool stuff happening. Exactly. And you know, the time is ripe, right? Like how many construction technology innovation podcasts were there even five or 10 years ago? So that's what's so exciting is, you know, to be here with you and your listeners and to have the chance to, to continue to create community and, and to move for change. Yeah. It's mind boggling to me how many voices have kind of popped up even in the last year. Uh, I guess uh, everybody shut in with, with COVID was like, let's start a podcast and, and start <laughs> spreading this word. But it's great. I, I think it's awesome that there's this big community of innovators that are making their voices heard in the industry now. Oh, yeah. Well, for sure, especially with the last year, everyone is looking for a way to stay connected. And this is, it'll be interesting to see when the world continues to fully open up how, you know, which pieces of this we we keep right? With yeah. pieces of this remote existence we've had. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I, and I, I don't really see it going fully back. You know, I think for a while it was like, well, how much is, is really going to stay? We go back to normal. And now then there's the new normal, but I think that what a lot of the processes that we have put in place, we've proven they can work in construction and technology is not that scary. So I, I don't see a lot of backsliding. What about oh, you? yeah, it's it's what's really interesting is we've seen this year, this past year, um, almost to a to a date, you know, a, a specific year that this has been. It's it's almost like it's been, uh, you know, a pressure cooker, right? Everything's sure. been accelerated and we have all learned and stretched in ways that we didn't think possible. And what's really cool is not only is, has our tech stock, our tech stack all improved, right? We've all become more robust in terms of the way we look at things like remote video conferencing or how to telework or how to, you know, get things done over email. But it's also something interesting where people have become more emboldened because you don't have that, you know, that, that senior member of your staff right next to you, Mm -hmm. teaching you or guiding you. So all of a sudden we all have to become the self-starters that maybe we weren't in the past to manage our own time. Yeah. That's really interesting. I also think that empathy has been injected into every facet of it as well too because how many times do you have an entire industry going through literally the exact same issue and facing the same challenge at the same time that everybody had to kind of figure out how to make it work with a hundred percent remote workforce and how do you keep a project going when your old ways of doing things literally you can't do it anymore I think that's what's been really um, beautiful about, you know, one of those those silver linings to the pandemic and what's been going on is that we have seen above and beyond the ability for contractors, architects, engineers, everyone to kind of come together. And there's no longer this like, uh, I mean, definitely everyone has their their own special niche, but there's there's this level of understanding, right? If your technology is not working or if you need to take a phone call while you're, um, you know, or have a meeting while you're driving or taking care of your kids or just balancing things differently. I think people are starting to see that maybe the things that we held on to so, for so many years, they don't need to be as uptight as they once were. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And, uh, you know, we got connected at Construction Progress Coalition uh, and it makes me think of all the, the shared pains that they talk about there. Everybody's experiencing these shared pains at the same time, which is a, a cool perspective. Exactly. And it's also too, it's been an accelerator in some really, you know, crazy, amazing ways for things like cybersecurity, things like, you know, having 
just not having to have the real estate of office space. So many contractors and engineers and designers that we work with or that I, you know, that I intimately, um, you know, have in my, my sphere of influence, they, you know, a lot of them are letting go of leases or they're changing mm-hmm. this idea that they have to recruit just from, you know, a specific geographical location and think of the, the opportunity that gives you. And so it's, it's definitely been a hard year for everyone, but it's like you said, it's been a shared year. And there've also been some really great ways that innovation, creativity, persistence has prevailed. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'd love to take a, a step back for a minute and have you tell your story of, of how you, you got into the construction industry to begin with. Yeah, of course. I think we, 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 as always, are so eager to kind of jump into the nitty gritty. <laughs> um, so uh, as you mentioned, I'm Tahira Ali. I have um, been in the construction industry, uh, I guess, properly and officially for about um, eight years now. And my background is in designing things and making them smart. So I have two degrees in um, mechanical engineering and computer science. So I kind of started my, uh, my early education really focused on, you know, how do you build things and then how do you make them uh, able to react or able to be, you know, just better than just stationary objects and give them the ability to, to have that intelligence. And so um, I come from a, uh, a background where I was not good at math. I was not good at science. I was not that great at engineering or computer science for that matter, but I was persistent <laughs> as hell. Nice. And um, yeah, so it's it's funny because I, I owe so much to the mentors who kind of helped, you know, stick it out with me. But everything from, you know, when I first was learning and educating myself, I, I was doing drafting by hand, right? I think AutoCAD was probably, and, and we're talking AutoCAD 2000, right? The black, uh, you know, the black, black background and the white lines. Yeah. That was probably one of my first loves that got me into the AEC space. And um, from there, I've done everything from work on uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence back when it was called neural networks. So before I even had a cool, cool brand name for things like the defense industry, the aerospace industry, the automotive industry. And um, I basically got to a point in my career in my life where I was just so impressed with the idea of user-focused design and how do you build things and solve problems for people who have so much more on their plate that you know you couldn't hope to dream to to do the work they're doing but how do you make their lives easier how do you make their lives better and so i spent um about eight years designing power tools and um through that kind of becoming a technologist and you know in specifically construction driven solutions and uh then i was able to i was very fortunate to be able to work you know not just on tools and solutions but software hardware peer groups culture how do you build best practices? And that led mm-hmm. to, um, since the last, I would say almost two months, I've been with uh, NECA, the National Electrical Contractors Association. And I, I am the executive director of industry innovation for NECA. And what's incredible is that it's kind of every piece of my career coming full circle. Nice. That's awesome. All the, that convergent point of being able to use all those uh, experiences that you've had. Exactly. Well, and I'm a big believer. I think everything I've done, I've always tried to be people focused, right? Mm -hmm. Um, From some of my 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 first jobs were working um, in conjunction with uh, UAW line workers who were designing and building physical, you know, building cars. And the things that you see in terms of someone who's done this for 30 years, they can just look at a piece of metal and with their hands practically like smooth it out. And so, you know, the, the thing that you learn about the skilled trades is that the, there's just so much knowledge there. And if we can do anything to help make the lives of those who are putting their lives on the line and those who are, you know, working day in and day out in all weather conditions and all environments to give us power, water, clean air, especially after COVID, we've seen how critical it is, especially after what, you know, what just happened in Texas, the importance of these these uh creature comforts in Mm. in in just the society that we have today it just can't be cannot be overstated and so it's just really great to be able to 
to take a step back and recognize that technology doesn't belong to everyone, innovation doesn't belong to everyone, and there's a chance to to really dig in on all levels. So to hear it coming into the construction industry, what were some of the kind of initial challenges that you you faced in your career and how do you, you seek to overcome them? That's a that's a really great question, Todd. And I think um, there's so many interesting things that um, we are challenged with that sometimes we don't even, I think, recognize that they're challenges because they're just kind of what you're used to. Um, and so it, it was interesting for me when I watched the movie Hidden Figures, because this idea of, you know, these NASA scientists who were doing this pivotal work, but weren't necessarily, you know, the ones who were published or the ones at the forefront and even mm -hmm. had to deal with things like not having a bathroom in the same facilities that they were in. I've had that in my career. I didn't, you know, it, at the time, it didn't even occur to me to feel sorry for myself or recognize like, oh, you got to go across the street to use the restroom. It was just, well, you're a woman and that's how it is. And so what's amazing and what's remarkable is even in my own career, I've been, you know, I've had the opportunity to be blessed with that perspective and to, to know what it's like to learn from women before me, but also to be, you know, a guiding force for those who come after me, men and women. And so that's been really incredible, but it's also, I think too, um, you know, I started designing power tools when I was in my twenties and it was something where, you know, I, I had never worked in heavy duty construction and I still haven't. And so I'm not the one who's, you know, climbing the power lines. I'm not the one who is, uh, you know, out on this roof in Miami in a hundred plus degree weather. And so it's all about how you focus on the person who is going to be doing the task or the person who's getting that exposure and kind of elevating your craft and using it as a challenge for how do you continue to grow to mm -hmm. continue to serve them? Yeah. I love that perspective. Cause it's at the end of the day, no matter what angle you're coming from, it's so important to see things from the other person's vantage point and perspective and try to put yourself in, in their shoes as much as possible. And you do that through conversations with people and getting to know them that, you know, the person behind the employee side of it. Absolutely. The power of behavioral research, the power of conversations, the power of helping to, you know, map out a workflow and figure out who, you know, where are those pain points in a process is just, you can't beat that. And it's, it's, it's something that if you can learn the skill to truly listen, and I'm still learning, right? Everybody is, That's hard. <laughs> but, but it, it just, it changes the way you look at things and it changes your perspective. And, and two, you know, I think, part of part of my success has been just pure luck right there's 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 a, a handful of things that I've done where I've worked really hard and I've been really passionate but at the end of the day again you know having great mentors having great advocates and sponsors and and even just being comfortable with knowing when you don't know everything because I feel like there are some days where I know almost nothing but it's just you know how do you continue to learn and how do you continue to be curious and grow yeah well, I, there's so much power and freedom in being able to admit that you don't know something and that you're not the expert on it and then go seek out somebody who is that's hard but there's a lot of power in that oh yeah it's so valuable and especially too i think being willing to be curious and being willing to challenge yourself and and create a culture in which others can challenge you or question you or help take things to the next level right that 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 idea um, that I think comes from improv, that that yes and, right? Mm, so mm -hmm. you start with something and then you figure out how do you make it better or different or beat it up? And, and I think, you know, again, as an engineer, um, my background and my proclivity is to hold things close to the chest, to try to build it perfect, you know, perfectly and, and, and achieve perfection. And it's just, it's laughable to think that you can do that without getting feedback and without, you know, including a community in, in the evolution of anything you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious, how would you define diversity inclusion? What does that mean to you? Oh, that's so, that's so interesting because, um, it comes up so much, you know, yeah. for me and in this line of work. Um, and I think what's, what's really powerful is that when you think about diversity, it isn't just skin color. It isn't just gender. It isn't just the language that you speak. It's the trade that you're in. Um, if you think a AEC, right, whether you're an architecture or an architect, an engineer or a construction 
um, professional, you have a different mindset and maybe a different education and different background just based on what you specialized in. So there's diversity of education level, there's diversity of region. I once gave a, a talk at a, a major conference where I talked about diversity of region and you know, here's what materials are used in the Pacific Northwest to build with versus what's used in you know, central Florida. Mm -hmm. And after the presentation, someone came up to me and they said, you know, this is a global conference, right? Like you realize like in Japan, we use bamboo for scaffolding. And so it was just, again, one of those moments of like, oh yeah, it's, it's completely different. And so again, there's just, I think we limit ourselves sometimes when we think diversity as, you know, just cultural or what you can see, because you can see two people who look identical and one may have, you know, grown up in a, in a different country or different, you know, trade or skill. And then you can also, when you think of diversity of age, that's a whole another opportunity for us to continue to, to grow. And I think the importance of inclusion is making sure that, you know, it's kind of the, the importance of not just checking the box and saying, oh, well, we have these people in our workforce, but do they have a voice? Do mm -hmm. they have the ability to drive impact? And that's really where you start to to make that difference on on being diverse and being inclusive in a way that is useful. Yeah, I, I love that, that having that diversity of thought. You know, I think that has such potential and power to help the construction industry continue to expand upon recruiting. You know, top talent and increase innovation, safer workplace, etc. What are your thoughts around how we take that and harness it to help with the uh, you know, the, the skilled labor shortage that everybody is still obviously talking about? Todd, that's such a good question. And the idea of diversity of thought, diversity of, of leadership and perspective is so important, especially when we consider the labor shortage. So, you know, when you're thinking of how to bring people into this industry, when you're thinking of how to leverage the voices and the talent that you have, whether it's uh, investigating your technology or building your own technology, um, you know, when you think of something like, um, a, a new piece of software or a new piece of hardware, like a, a, a robotic total station, having the voice of not just your field crew and not just your VDC managers and not just your, um, you know, your IT support, having all of those voices at the table makes a huge difference. And that's what I think comes into play when we start to think about like recruitment and our labor shortage, because, you know, construction, the construction industry is so, you know, just there's so many challenges and such a small percentage of construction workers are considered, you know, in those minority classes. So how do we bring more women? How do we bring more underrepresented minorities into the conversation? And by doing so, we not only build stronger companies, but we also, you know, try to address that labor shortage and try to figure out ways that people can come together and be a part of our industry. Yeah. So uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it's something like just under 10% of all construction professionals are women. How do you think we go about making the construction industry more inclusive and appealing to women and minorities moving forward to, to bring more into this great industry? Well, and Todd, I think I, I, I know that I'm familiar with the statistic that you're referencing, and I believe that it's, it's just under 10%. I think uh, around 7% are women and of the field, it's only about 3%. Yeah. So think about the, the power there. And what, what I would recommend and what I always kind of try to coach um, is that if you want people to see your industry, or you want people to see opportunities for themselves in, in anything you're doing, you have to give them examples and role models. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is where you don't necessarily want to always like take, you know, those women or minorities or people in your company and take them on a road show, but you do want to make sure that their voices are heard. And you want to make sure that for the, for the men in the room and the men, you know, who are in leadership positions in your organization, make sure that when their voices are heard, make sure that their voices are heard supporting and backing up the principles that you want to, to espouse. So again, when you look at something like you know, it's not just enough to have your core values hanging on a plaque in the CEO's office, but how do you take those values and live them? How do you advertise them? And how do you structure the mission of, of who you are as a company around telling a broader story than just, you know, we, we pull wire or we, 
you know, we are in charge of HVAC. It, it, it's got to be about the rewarding side of things and kind of that, that finding your why piece to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think it goes back to something that you mentioned earlier too, of it really comes back to people and having those conversations, humanizing everybody else and really seeking out those conversations with different perspectives and different vantage points. Absolutely. And I, you know, I ran a technology group for a very long time. Um, and one of our, our kind of our, our team mantras was this idea of be a human, right? Yeah. And so it's kind of, you can geek out and you can get so excited and you can go down this rabbit hole. But at the same time, it was just always remember your humanity, because whether you're thinking of something from the perspective of, you know, a new technology, a new idea, what's it like for the people that have to implement it? What's it like for the people that need to be trained on it? And, and again, you know, it's the same thing with recruitment, right? You want to figure out, and, and so many of you out there, I would challenge you first, first and foremost, do you have a company website? Because not everyone does. And if you do, what do people see when they look on it? Are they seeing your board of directors? Are they seeing, um, you know, a company history that doesn't give them something to identify with? Or are they seeing motivators? And are they seeing something that can hook them? And if so, well, you know, let's get down to brass tacks. What hooks do you have? Is there a way for people to, to, to reach out and, and, and talk to you to, to create that, you know, that engagement just from internet surfing or just from hearing about or seeing about or reading about your company? Yeah, that's so good. It, can they identify with you and see themselves as part of the, the company? I think that's and huge. And, and again, you know, it's, it's interesting because it doesn't necessarily, again, mean, oh, hey, we want to recruit a certain gender or a certain ethnicity. So we have to put our website in a, you know, like have it bilingual, although that would really help in a lot of cases, but it's even just, we want people of good character. So let's make sure that our external communications show the character and the moral fiber of who we are. Right. Well, I think the key there is it has to be authentic and it has to come through as being authentic because people can sniff out if you're just, you know, throwing up a bunch of pictures and there's nothing there to behind it. The culture's not there to support that. You're not, you know, really valuing that diversity of thought and seeking out those conversations. They're going to pick up on that really quickly and it's going to do more harm in the long run. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I once spent about two days out with a, a contractor in, um, in the Pacific Northwest and we, talked about technology. I met with his IT team. I met with his executive staff and we looked at robots and we looked at tracking and we looked at wearables and we looked at uh, software. And after all of this, after, you know, touring their prefab shop and their logistics and their tool crib and all of these places, he took me into the, like the main kind of executive area mm -hmm. and on the wall was an org chart. And he started pointing at people and saying, you know, like we hired him straight out of college. She came to us from an internship. She's a star. He's a star that, you know, they're going to be the future of the company. And he said to me, you know, he said, everything that I told you, none of it matters without this. At the end of the day, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Intentionally, we double down on having a powerful culture. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's, that's it. That's what we're doing. You know, none of us are here because this is such a lucrative industry that we can just, you know, lay our heels back and, and, and watch the money roll in. We are all working hard. So how do you make sure that you're working smarter and creating the right culture and the right strategy to go hand in hand? Yeah, absolutely. I'm more than agree with all that. <laughs> uh, well, to hear what's your approach then to, to understanding the different perspectives of, of coworkers that you know may come from different backgrounds and experiences in even in their you know professional life? I think Todd, the again, it, it, I feel a little bit um, you know redundant because so many times my answer is is the same. It's it's listen and learn, right? And so there's there's just so much to be gained from understanding people's perspectives. I you know, as a leader, as a mentor, as a colleague, and as a friend, you know, I'm a big believer of things like, um, you know, understanding people's, if they so choose to, to talk about it, their disc profile, their Myers-Briggs, like there's a lot of science behind that. But mm -hmm. even things like the idea of situational leadership, the idea that as a leader, and again, that could be a leader with a title or just 
you know, as a human being who wants to grow and be better, it is our responsibility to meet people where they're at. So whether you're thinking of motivations, whether you, whether you're thinking of just the way that people are in terms of, you know, they could be an expert. Let's say you have an expert architect and they're just amazing. And they they get so far in their career that all of a sudden they they get to become a manager. And now that's a whole different skill set. Now they have people they're in charge of. And so it's helping, you know, helping your coworkers, helping your colleagues understand that, you know, it's okay to, to be great at architecting, you know, at architecture and not necessarily know how to be a manager and how can you work with them? Because so many times in, in, in construction and engineering and in all of our industries, what we see is you become so good at something that you get tasked with something else. And anyone who's an expert never, you know, never wants to show that they don't know how to do something. But sometimes the most powerful thing you can do is just be there for someone and ask them, you know, whether it's personally or professionally, how can I help? What's going on? What are your goals? What what can I do to help you get there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you brought up DISC. I, I love DISC and, and personality profiles. I, I think it's so incredibly valuable to uh, just understand how people receive information. Uh, that's my favorite part about DISC is, is getting to know how people want to be communicated to, and then how their natural style of communicating back. Cause that's so important. If, if I'm talking to somebody and they just want bullet points, well, I need to know that and then cut out the, the small talk and don't tell stories, just get straight to the point where other people want you to tell the stories and that's how they connect. So, and it's extremely a valuable tool. Especially I think in the year that we've had, I think it's just so interesting because some people have wanted more of that human connection. And some people have wanted less of it, right? Not everyone wants to go to a Zoom happy hour right. when they can you know, be home with their family and their kids are knocking on the door, but not everyone has a family knocking on the door. And so creating those, those elements and those avenues for deep connection is, even if it's deep connection for a half an hour and you never see that person again, you know, what value that can bring to your life. Yeah, for sure. Well, looking out over the next few years, what excites you the most about construction? I think what's really exciting is that we're starting to see the shift from, you know, construction was get things done for so long. And then in the early 2000s, it became figure out how to survive when, you know, when we hit, we hit the, you know, 2008, 2009 timeframe. And then emerging from that, it became, oh, hey, technology has not you know, splashed its, its magic on this, this genre. And now we've got, you know, thousands of context startups and we've got all this money going in. And I think what we're seeing now as we go into the twenties is we're seeing what has staying power. We're seeing what has that ROI. And so that I think is really exciting. And then two, the, the big push towards um, just driving the right decisions at the right time. And so I, it's so easy to say, oh, well, it's data, right? It's all about data, but it's not about data. It's about what that data brings you. And that's what's exciting is it's, you know, it's, it's seeing these point solutions emerge and mature to a point where they can interact with each other. It's seeing not just, again, you know, the, the ability to collect information, but what do you do with it? How can you drive decisions? And that's, mm -hmm. that's how we hit the bottom line. Yeah. So do you think that really being able to harness and leverage the data is kind of the, the most potential for innovation in the industry? I think that harnessing and leveraging the data is for some companies, that's it. That's the golden ticket. And for some companies, it's not even yet harnessing the data, but it's getting your arms around the workflow and knowing what you do and how you do it so that you can optimize that is, is, is what it is. And then again, for, for companies that are maybe at a different end of that spectrum, it's taking that data and using it to stand up new streams of revenue, right? Whether it's getting into prefab or getting into modular or getting into, you know, service or microgrid or whatever it is. It's, it's all about approaching things with, with a clear understanding of where you are so that you can understand how you can grow. Yeah. So a little honest, uh, self-reflection of, of where you stand on that uh, kind of sliding curve there and do what needs to be done to get to the next level. 
Exactly. And, and again, you know, you can be the smallest company in the world, but if you have the best culture, you know, leverage your strengths. Right. And that's the, the beauty of this is you don't have to be all things to all people, but you just have to recognize who you are and do that really, really well. Mm -hmm. Well said. Well, how do people get a hold of you and find out more about what you're doing at, at Nika and the Innovation Studio podcast that you got going on? I, you know, that is a great question. Um, so I can be reached at tahira at nikanet.org. Um, I am also uh, available um, on LinkedIn. I am available via the Nika website. So again, nikanet.org. And then um, you can also catch me on a weekly basis on Innovation Overload, which is the Nika Innovation Podcast. And what's really fun there is we spend a lot of time talking with leaders who are who are living that innovation challenge and what what overwhelms them and then how do they kind of get their arms around things like software, hardware, training, recruitment. So it's all about how do we problem solve together. Awesome. Uh, well, last question. What does innovation mean to you? Ah, touche. <laughs> um, so that's, that's a great question. Again, I look at innovation as the opportunity to grow. And so whether you are growing in a technology way or looking for new tech or new solutions to problems that you want to kind of solve to get to the next level, or whether you're looking at it from a change management culture, people side of things, I think innovation can mean so many things, but the underlying piece is how do you continue to have that, that, that drive for success. Awesome. Well, Tahir, thanks so much for joining the show and chatting with us today. Really appreciate oh, it. Of course, Todd. It was such a pleasure. And again, you know, I think this is something that we get to do together as an industry. So that's the nice part is whether your one step that you take is a podcast, which, you know, here you're already done, or whether it's just reading an article, you know, everybody has a, an opportunity to start somewhere. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, we're definitely all in this together and it's going to take everybody working collectively to, to get us where we need to go.